I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles, and here are your data points. Maryland, my home state. It was the seventh state to join the union, and now the 16th state on the verge of passing a comprehensive data protection law. As a result, we wanted to do an instant reaction podcast to cover what's in the bill, both quickly and efficiently. And in particular, how similar is this bill to the other state laws that we have analyzed? And importantly, what is different? To discuss, I've invited my returning guest, Arsamar Danoa, to the podcast. Arsamar is an associate in our privacy and cybersecurity practice. He is somebody who spends a lot of his time working on legislative updates for clients across the firm. Arsmar, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me here and happy to discuss Maryland and all the changes it brings. Yes. All right. So let's dive into it. I mean, first, why don't we just start with an overview? What is in this bill? Does it look similar to the other state laws? Yeah. So the good news is, for the most part, the bill is very similar to a lot of the state laws we've seen before. Things like similar transparency requirements, similar opt-outs, There's also a data protection impact assessment requirements. So in broad strokes, it is very similar. That said, there are a few key differences, particularly around how sensitive data is treated, how miners' data is treated, and around data minimization in particular that are going to put, you know, they're a real big sticking point compared to what other states have done before. Okay, so common elements from the ones that we have seen before, individual rights, obligations, kind of limitations and opt-outs of sale, kind of all of those are kind of common that we've seen in other states all appear now in the Maryland bill. That's right. Okay, and then as we think about some of the other important exceptions, how are we looking at business-to-business data, employee data, kind of areas where we've seen some least differences early on with California? So Maryland continues a trend there where business-to-business data and employee data are still carved out, which is a helpful piece. California sort of still remains the only one that touches those areas directly. Okay. So still we're in place where we don't need to start to extend a Maryland compliance program to business to business data and employee data. So importantly, if it looks largely the same, are there any unique components to the Maryland bill that our audience needs to be aware of? Yeah. So the big one is around data minimization. A lot of the other states typically take the approach where you can only use data in terms of what is reasonable and proportionate and necessary with respect to any purpose you've disclosed to the user. Maryland says, we're not going to use that approach. We're going to use a stricter data minimization standard where it needs to be reasonably necessary and proportionate to providing the specific product or service that a consumer has requested. And so in terms of the broader purposes that you may have disclosed, Maryland says, no, listen, it really needs to be tied to that product or service. That said, there's probably going to be some wiggle room or some gray areas in terms of how we define, you know, what is the specific product or service? Yeah, right. So if I'm thinking of somebody who's offering a website available to Maryland consumers and you know information is being tracked about those individuals as they interact with the website, is that really the product or service? you know, that those individuals are provided? Is the website the product or is that the service for which then that information is being collected and thus subject to that minimum necessary or data minimization requirement? Exactly. And it can get tricky. We've had questions already around, does targeted advertising fit into providing a product or service? And on its face, you might say no, but I think when you think about it, you start to realize it gets a bit more complicated because if targeted advertising were never part of providing a product or service, why would the law include an opt-out right for it? And so there are a lot of tricky questions with this data minimization principle here in Maryland that are going to bring up questions that haven't come up under some of the other state laws. So data minimization, one key difference And I understand that there are kind of other key differences around sensitive data, biometric data. How have we seen that play out? So one of the big differences on sensitive data is the fact that there's a broad prohibition on on selling sensitive data altogether. And in addition to that, there's also sort of a broader definition of what might be considered sensitive compared to what we've seen in other states. For example, you mentioned biometric data. Typically, biometric or genetic information is treated as sensitive if it's used to identify a person. Here, Maryland has said, listen, even if you're not identifying someone, we're still going to treat this as sensitive. There's also, in terms of other expansions, normally it's data that involves someone who's under 13 or that you know is under 13 is sensitive. Here they say it's either that you know the person is under 13 or you should have reason to know 
that they are, which again, broadens the scope of what might be considered sensitive there. And so it's a straight prohibition on the sale, except for when there's a consent. So the sale definition has a range of exceptions that go to it. So there's some wiggle room there of saying, it's not so much saying that, oh, someone's given consent to the sale, as opposed to because they've given consent, is this actually a sale or is it something where it's a directed disclosure or some other relevant exception? Okay. So sounds to me like there's some work there that needs to be done to try to harmonize this approach with obviously the other state laws and the growing uncertainty around what the federal government considers to be sensitive information. And in particular, how the FTC has been pushing into this area and indicating that some types of data are going to either require consent or in some cases, maybe not be able to be sold at all. That's exactly right. So then how about some of those other key things that we worry about? Private rights of action, agency rulemaking, where does Maryland fall in those areas? So on the private right of action, the way that Maryland treats enforcement is that it imports the enforcement authority under Maryland's Unfair and Deceptive Acts and Practices Act, their general consumer protection law, but it specifically carves out the private right of action that is available under that law. So that's the good news. The less good news is the fact that Maryland says that all other remedies available to consumers are still there. And so consumers may try to look to tort law, things like invasion of privacy or publication of private facts as a way to say, listen, this person violated the Maryland statute. That's evidence that they actually violated or committed one of these torts. Okay, so we have to still worry about it and appreciate the existing kind of non privacy focused oriented area claims. And it could well be that this statute, while itself doesn't include a private right of action, may be the basis for bringing in some of those other non privacy oriented claims. That's exactly right. And rulemaking is actually very similar in that while Maryland doesn't directly grant rulemaking authority under that general consumer protection law, Maryland has the authority to delineate or create rules to effectuate the purpose of it. And so we may see rules under that other law that interpret how this privacy law is actually applied. Okay. So, and I guess maybe another good piece of news is that there is, at least for some period, a cure right. That's right. And so this one expires in 2027. So it isn't one of the states where they've decided the cure period is going to go on forever. But it's at least helpful in the interim as people sort of adjust to the differences that Maryland has in place, particularly as they sort of work out the kinks with the sensitive data sales, the data minimization standard, and all those other nuances. Okay. We're recording this mid-April, April April 16, 2024. And as I understand it, this has passed now both houses with inside of the Maryland legislature. It's now waiting the governor's signature. And if that is signed, when will this take effect? This one will take effect in October 2025. And so there's some time that companies are going to have in order to prepare for it. But it's still one of those things that you want to get started thinking about early on, just as you mentioned, because you won't be able to necessarily exactly rely on what you've done for some of the other states. Okay, so that part maybe is the way that I would love to maybe close our conversation. You know, I think many of our listeners and those who are pushing forward privacy programs within their organizations are getting kind of used to trying to scale you know, their program to accommodate these new laws. As I think about what the additional level of effort would be for Maryland compared to what they had to do in you know, Connecticut or Utah or Delaware or any of the other states who have passed their own laws, where do you feel like that effort is going to have the largest return of investment for Maryland? And how could that potentially shape strategy for other states that may pass their own version of this law. So Scott, I think one of the key parts are going to be around understanding what data you actually have, and then being able to sort of update the classifications of that data as a new state like Maryland starts to change the line slightly, because it's much easier to go off of, you know, an existing inventory and make those changes than try to say, let's do another round of mapping exercises. It's a similar piece around data minimization really understanding what data you know do we have and how exactly are we using it because then you can understand okay there's this new standard does that mean that there's any impact to us and how we use the data or can we continue with our program as we designed it so really two important points that you're making are smart because in my experience there are areas that are organizations consistently have trouble with data minimization 
data classification, and if I would add on to that data retention, are probably three of the, at least the top 10. And it sounds like Maryland is putting the pressure on at least two of those points directly, which I think will be a pain point for all U.S.-based organizations. That's exactly right. And really on the data minimization front and the use limitations, these are ones that regulators across the globe are highlighting more and more and are trying to look for, you know, not just at a superficial level, but, you know, are your lawyers talking with your engineers to make sure that you are applying this the right way? Yeah, that's where data governance all of a sudden now has become the law of the land. All right, Smart, thanks so much for coming and joining me on the podcast. I always learn so much in our conversations. And so thank you for sharing their insights with the audience. With that, I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles. And those were your data points. 